Radio. You are listening to Texas History Lessons, a slow walk through Texas history made in Texas by a Texan for everyone everywhere. Texas. There are many iconic images that come to mind when you say the name. Cowboys, the Alamo, Longhorns, Oil Wells, Armadillos, and Willie Nelson. And I could go on and on and on with things identified and associated with Texas. But out of the many things I could continue listing, there are two that have to be on every list. One is football. Texans love football. They're crazy for it. Some say that football is pretty much like a religion down here. So it comes naturally that Texans love to remember and honor their football heroes. And speaking of heroes, there's another long-standing tradition in Texas of honoring the servicemen and women that have served in the military, especially those that made the ultimate sacrifice and gave their lives on behalf of their state and their nation. Now, if you had been down in Austin on Wednesday afternoon, November 11th, back in 2009, and you happened to have been at the northwest corner of the University of Texas's football stadium, Darrell K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium, you could have witnessed a ceremony that was being held there at the Frank Dennis Veterans Memorial Plaza, which is on the northwest corner of the stadium. Larry Gatlin of Gatlin Brothers Music fame was there to sing. And there were active military present when a statue of a World War I soldier was unveiled. Now, this statue is known by the term of the Doughboy statue, using the name the United States infantrymen of the Great War, World War I, were called. It was created by Texas Hill Country artist Paul Tadlock, who's said to be one of America's leading sculptors of American figures, nature, and the outdoors. His works have been installed in many public displays, like this one, as well as in museums and galleries. Now, this statue stands in honor of all the people who have served in the United States military. But the fact that it is a doughboy is especially significant, given the fact that one of the first Americans one of the very first Texans and the first United States officer from Texas to die in the Great War was not only an esteemed graduate of the University of Texas, but also one of the most respected players in the history of the University of Texas Longhorn football team. It is also significant because it was created by a Hill Country artist and the man that lost his life in 1918 was also from the Hill Country. This is the story of Louis, or sometimes called Louis Jordan. It's also the story of Texas and the Great War from 1914 to 1918. It's the story of the foundations of Texas football. And it's a story of patriotism and teamwork, of loss and sacrifice. It's about leadership and the cost of war. Welcome to Texas History Lessons. I'm Michael, and when I first started looking into this bit of history, I thought it'd be about 15, 20 minutes long, and that would be it. But then, as it usually happens, I started looking into it, and there's a lot more to this story than I originally thought. So instead of just a short, quick episode, this is going to be a two-parter. And today we're going to start with the early life of Lewis Jordan. And then we'll be back with another episode that deals with World War I and his service there. Now, Lewis Jordan was born on January 30th, 1890 in Fredericksburg, Texas to William F. Jordan and Augusta Keller Jordan. 
Fredericksburg, which is about 80 miles west of Austin, had been settled in the hill country during the 1840s by German immigrants. About 70 years before the United States entered the Great War, a small party of German immigrants had set out from New Braunfels with the fertile lands and hills near the Pedernales River as their destination. Once there, they erected rough-hewn cabins with sloping roofs and tall chimneys and began to farm the valleys. It wasn't always easy, but in time, they put down deep roots in the Texas soil and made it their beloved home. Louis Jordan's mother and all four of his grandparents were born in present-day Germany. The father, William, had been born in Gillespie County in 1856 and lived until 1929. The mother, Augusta, had been born in Germany in 1869. William and Augusta Jordan had six children. Louis was the fourth of two boys and four girls. Emma Jordan, born in 1884, she lived in 1979. Harry H. Jordan was born in 1885, and he lived a nice long life to 1977. Anna Jordan Kaufman lived from 1888 to 1968. And then came Louis Jordan in 1890. And after Lewis was Betty Jordan Neffendorf, who lived from 1894 all the way up to 1985. And there was the baby of the family, Elsie Jordan Hinky, who lived from 1898 to 1976. Lewis gained his initial early education from the Fredericksburg Public School. And as a boy, he helped work on his family ranch in Live Oak. He graduated in 1906 at the age of 16 with a four-year state teaching certificate. He worked for a time at Stein's Lumberyard in Fredericksburg, and then he went to teach at the Honey Creek School. Lewis and the Jordan family lost his mother, Augusta, on June 30th, 1907, when she was 37 years old and he was 17. She was buried in the Fredericksburg Der Stadt Friedhof Cemetery. A couple of years after his mother's death, Jordan made a change, and at the age of 20, in 1910, he enrolled in San Antonio Academy, which was founded in, back in 1886 and was the first private school in the state to be given full affiliation by the University of Texas. Jordan apparently gained his first introduction to football while at the academy. And he also did well in his studies, and he graduated in a year with a scholarship to the University of Texas, Austin. When Louis Jordan set foot on the University of Texas, Austin's campus that year at the age of 21, no doubt he, like most of us, probably didn't have a really good idea what the future would hold for him. He decided to major in electrical engineering and as a scholar-athlete, would earn a place on the honor roll for the subject in each of his four years at the university. And he also stood out because of his size. He was recruited to play on the football team, despite having little experience. And the big freshman gained a spot on the football team and eventually became its captain by the time he was a senior. His size, speed, leadership ability, and quick thinking made him a valuable member of the team. And he also seemed to be a likable person. People remembered Louis Jordan. Compared to today's lineman, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed guard would not stack up very well. But in the early 1900s, he was a sizable force, standing at the height of six foot one and weighing 205 pounds. Doesn't sound that big for people in Texas these days. But this was big for that time, and he was usually the second biggest, if not the biggest player on the team. His draft registration card describes him as tall and stout. Even into the 1960s, he might have still been able to play when you consider that Warren Grimble started for the University of Texas at guard in 1967 and was six foot one, 216 pounds. It's also important to note that football was very different back then. It was still developing into the sport that we know today. And at the time, the sport was still run and managed by the students. It was such 
a rough, violent sport that back in 1905, just a few years before Jordan went to University of Texas, after at least 19 players across the United States died playing. And I'll repeat that. In 1905, 19 players died playing football, and this caused such a commotion that President Theodore Roosevelt threatened to cancel the sport until better rules for safety could be implemented. Now, he didn't have the authority, apparently, to do that, but it brought attention, and so people started getting more concerned and trying to make the sport safer. A long ways from it what it is today, but they were beginning to do what they could. The American football had developed from rugby and soccer in the 19th century and over time became a marquee sport. Walter Camp, the father of American football, was instrumental in the 1880s in laying the foundational rules for modern football. And Camp personally selected an all-American team every year from 1889 through 1924. It was a great honor to be recognized as a Walter Camp All-American. It's also important to note that while the Longhorn players were great athletes, we also need to remember that there were a lot of other great athletes that might have made an impact on the team, but couldn't because they weren't white. It would be many years before the team was integrated. Jordan lettered his freshman year at UT. His teammates were from all over the state. Frost Woodhull, who was said to be the fastest end in the South, and a fellow graduate of San Antonio Academy, was on the team. There were players from Midlothian, Austin, Blanco, Orange, Floresville, Brownwood, Temple, Houston, Dallas, and Bonham. And Marshall Ramsdale of Austin was the team captain that year. So with a new guard from Fredericksburg on the team and a new coach, the UT Longhorns took to the field. Now, the record for the past few years had been decent, but not great. They'd posted a 5-4 record in 1908, a 4-3-1 record in 1909, and a 6-2 record in 1910. 25-year-old Dave Allardyce, a former All-American from Michigan, became the head coach of the football team after the previous coach, who was friends with Allardyce, died a tragic death from an accident a few days before beginning of the season. Apparently, the previous coach had slept walked out of his second floor apartment and then died later from injuries. During the season, Allardyce coached the Longhorns to an upset victory of 6-0 against the Aggies. Some look to this bitter game as one of the events that led to a really bitter interschool rivalry over the next few decades. Home games were played at Clark Field on the UT campus. And in the opening game against Southwestern, University of Texas won with a score of 11 to 2. They next went on to beat Baylor 11 to nothing. They won against Arkansas 12 to 0. Swanee beat UT in a tough game with a final score of 5 to 6. Next, UT faced rivals Texas A&M in a game in Houston that ended with a 6 to nothing win. They then dominated Auburn, winning 18 to 5. They close out the season with a 3-6 to six loss, playing in Dallas against their nemesis, Oklahoma, in the Red River shootout. After the 1911 season came to an end, the team selected Frost Woodhull to be the team captain for the 1912 season. And in 1912, the team rebounded from the bitter loss to Oklahoma to start the season with a 30-10 to 10 victory over TCU. Next, they faced a tough game against Austin College, winning only 3-0. to zero. The Longhorns had a chance at redemption against Oklahoma and Dallas on October 19th, but the Sooners handed them their only loss of the year again in a 6-21 to 21 game. Following that loss, Jordan and his teammates began to pick up steam. They defeated the Haskell Indians Institute 14-7. to seven. They followed that up with a win against Baylor with a score of 19-7, to seven. When they next faced off against Ole Miss in a game played in Houston, 
the Longhorns exploded to win 53-14. to The season ended with a 28-3 to win over Southwestern and a 48 to nothing destruction of Kansas. That gave the Longhorns a seven-win, one-loss season. Things were starting to turn around. The November 13th, 1912 against A&M in Houston was the hardest-fought gridiron battle ever staged in Texas, some papers claimed. A&M fielded larger players, about 15 pounds to the man, bigger, but UT won 6-0. to It was the heaviest team ever fielded by either A&M or Texas. Now, going into that game, with Sowani having defeated Texas, A&M, who were undefeated this season, were pretty confident of a victory. Feelings were so bad after the University of Texas win against A&M that they stopped playing each other until A&M coach Morin stopped coaching after the 1914 season. Marshall Ramsdale captained the team that consisted of Jordan, Nelson Puitt, who played quarterback, Arnold Kirkpatrick, Frost Woodhull, Johnny James, Bill Burge, Demps Bland, and Leonard Barrel, the Harrell brothers, and Earl Sellers. A&M broke the leg of one of the Harrell brothers on the very first play of the game. The Longhorns rallied, and the only score of the game came after Johnny James hit an A&M player so hard he fumbled the ball, and Kirkpatrick carried the ball down the field for a touchdown. Most of the UT players played the entire game on offense and defense. Only 13 Longhorns saw the field that day. The Longhorns started the 1913 season with a 14-7 win over Polytechnic College. It's not known as that now. Today, we know of it as Texas Wesleyan University. They did better against Austin College this season with a 27-6 win, which they followed up with a 77-0 annihilation of Baylor. Next, they got revenge against Swanee with a 13-7 win and a game played up in Dallas. Southwestern lost again to the Longhorns with a score of 52-0. In 1913, they played the Red River shootout again against Oklahoma, and this time they won 14-6. Kansas State suffered a bad loss against UT when the Longhorns scored 46 unanswered points. Then, in the last game of the year, the Longhorns faced off on Clark Field in Austin against Notre Dame. The Fighting Irish, led by Captain Newt Rockney, prevailed with a final score of 7-30. to that gave the Longhorns a respectable 7-1 to record, with the one loss being handed to them by the dominating Notre Dame squad. 1913 was especially significant because that was the year that the new UT athletic director, Leo Theo Bellamont, shifted control of the football team from student organizations to the university and introduced the plan that would lead to the formation of the Southwest Conference in 1914. The 1913 season had been one of the toughest schedules the Longhorns had ever faced in its history. After the 1913 season, 17 members of the Longhorn football team elected Jordan to the post of team captain. Hopes were high for the next season. Jordan, according to a Temple newspaper, had been, quote, the terror of every opponent at guard and he had played the game of his life against Notre Dame. Big Lewis Jordan, at 205 pounds, was the largest man on the team. That year saw the following players write in J.A. Edmond of Waco, tackle Alva Carlton of Houston, center W.O. Murray of Floresville, center Dittmar of Houston, tackle Grady Noble of Dallas, and C.E. Turner of Roswell, New Mexico, L.C. Barrel of Houston, was the quarterback for the team, and W.C. Brown of Austin played halfback and was the team captain that year. Fullback Clyde Littlefield of Arkansas played and started getting noticed as being a great player, and he would be tied as a coach for a very long time in the future for the University of Texas. 
Emmy Daniels was fullback from San Antonio. Paul Simmons of San Antonio played halfback as well. J.H. Goodman played guard for Austin. And J.C. Bass played tackle, and he was from San Antonio. And E.R. Barry of Austin also played tackle. Now, after that season, the Longhorns lost five players. Brown, Daniels, Niblo, Leftwich, and Murray were moving on. Still, the freshman that year had played very well, and with Lewis Jordan captaining the team, everybody had really high hopes for the next season. With Jordan, Burge, Goodman, Barrel, and Littlefield returning, the team had what some called a formidable array of football talent. Taking away the Notre Dame game, Texas had scored 242 points to the opponent's collective 28. You add in the Notre Dame game, and the total is 249 to 53. People were eager to face another Northern school because the idea was that the Northern schools just had better reputations and were considered to be better at the game. UT wanted to show everybody that that wasn't true. Coach Dave Allardyce agreed to return for two more seasons, and in three years, he had led the team to 19 wins and four losses, two being to Oklahoma, one to Swanee, and one to the legendary Notre Dame. And for the 1913 season, the Longhorns had paid back Oklahoma and Swanee with defeats. After losing only one game in 1913 to Notre Dame, during his senior year in 1914, Jordan would again play right guard and play on defense, and serving as captain of the team, he and Coach Allardyce led the Longhorns to an undefeated season of eight wins and zero losses. The team outscored all combined opponents 358 to 21. That's an average of 44 and three quarter points per game compared to an average of two point six by their opponents. So 1914, Lewis Jordan was going to be playing his final season with the Longhorns. He had been selected as captain of the team and coach Allardyce was in his fourth year of coaching the team. It was the Longhorns turn to dominate. They beat San Antonio's Trinity University with a score of 30 to zero. Baylor again got destroyed with a score of 57 to zero. They beat Rice 41 to nothing. And in the Red River shootout for 1914, University of Texas Longhorns beat Oklahoma 32 to seven. At the 1914 game versus Oklahoma, the Longhorns got off to a bad start playing in Dallas before a crowd of 7,500 at Gaston Field, the Texas League baseball park, because horse racing had taken precedence that day at the state fairgrounds. Oklahoma football legend Montford Hap Johnson received the opening kickoff and ran it back for a 75 or 85-yard touchdown. Sources differ on the distance. It was a bad start to the game. It probably made some people pretty concerned. But Jordan stepped up, and the bad start inspired Jordan to inspire his team. He wasn't happy with the way the game was beginning, and he gathered his teammates around him. In later years, Clyde Littlefield, who was on the field that day playing halfback, he remembered that moment, and he said Jordan told us in no mincing words, with a few cuss words in German and some in English, Nobody leaves this field until we beat the hell out of them. Littlefield, a Texas athletic star himself, went on to coach both football and track and field after college, and he remembered Jordan's leadership for the rest of his entire life. That was it for Oklahoma that day. They did not score again, and Texas won the game after scoring 32 straight points. Bill Little wrote that, yes, Jordan was a phenomenal athlete for his time, but, quote, what he brought to the game is the enduring quality that every coach searches for and every player they seek and every company worth a toot desires, leadership. 
In the next game, the Longhorns decimated Southwestern again with a 70-0 to win. They next played Haskell again and won 23-7. to After that win, the Houston Post wrote that Jordan had, quote, proved his right to the claim that he is one of the best guards Texas has ever produced. The big blonde captain of the Orange fighting throughout the game like a demon. The manager for Haskell said that Jordan and the Texas line was superior to that of Notre Dame. They had played Notre Dame as well. Facing off against Ole Miss, University of Texas put up 66 points to 7 and then finished the 1914 undefeated season with a 39-0 win over Wabash College. Excitement was high going into that final game. Despite murky weather, 4,300 fans from all over the state showed up to watch the undefeated Longhorns face Wabash. Rain during the week left the field very, very muddy. Despite the slippery, muddy mess of the field and the darkness of the day from heavy cloud cover, both teams did their best. The Longhorns' best was just a lot better. Observers said Wabash were the best team UT had faced on Clark Field that year. The Longhorns had experimented with the forward pass that season with great success, but the conditions made it difficult to use it in that game. The Longhorns used their superior size and speed to get their final victory of the year. Wabash could not break through Jordan's UT defensive line and they only made five first downs in the game. Two came from both lines crashing and Wabash pushing forward as a group. The other three were from end runs and short forward passes. The Austin Statesman declared that, quote, the Longhorns played as a machine. In the first quarter, Texas scored 20 points, then seven in the second. They blocked to perfection, and everyone fulfilled their role on every play, and at halftime, Texas was ahead 27 to nothing. Then they scored six in the third and six in the fourth for a 39-0 to final. From the first quarter on, the players were covered with mud, and tacklers often slid off when they hit. Jordan, Littlefield, Nielsen, Edmund, and Walker had clean uniforms on when the second half began, but that did not stay the way it was for very long. For Jordan and four others, Beryl, Nielsen, Goodman, and Keck, it would be their final game. And it was the first undefeated season since 1900. The Austin Statesman praised Jordan, writing, Big Lewis Jordan won his first letter four years ago when a freshman. Since that time, he has filled a position on the Longhorns line each year. He has always been a tower of strength as a forward. He plays with the tenacity of a bulldog, blocking, breaking through the opposing lineman, smashing the opponent's play, and frequently throws the runner for great losses. In the game yesterday, he was seen in nearly every play. Besides always playing an excellent game, he has the respect of everyone who knows him because of his clean work. He has proven to be, with all his other accomplishments, a leader of men, one who would never ask a teammate to do anything that he would not try himself. During his years on the team, UT football had recorded 27 wins and just four losses. A tenacious player, Jordan was later remembered as being one of the most highly regarded athletes in UT football program's first few decades and I know I said it before but it's important to remember he and many of the other players usually played both offense and defense now each year that he was on the team and each year with coach Allardyce the team had improved and for many of the the players Allardyce worked with including Jordan football was still relatively new By his senior year, the experienced Longhorn line was described as a terror and Jordan was the demon giving it leadership. The most powerful man on the Longhorn team, he matched his great size and strength with great speed and routinely smashed the opposing team's running back. 
behind the line of scrimmage. Always alert, Jordan routinely recovered fumbles. Now, for the 1914 All-Texas team, 10 Longhorns were selected. Right guard and Captain Lewis Jordan, of course, was on the first team, and he was joined by other Longhorns like right end Edmonds, right tackle Burge, center Dittmar, left guard Goodman, left tackle Barry, left end Turner, quarterback Barrel, halfback Clyde Littlefield, and the fullback Nielsen. The left halfback Everett of A&M was the only non-Longhorn player on the first team. Two Longhorns made the second team. The Austin Statesman declared that the team could not be improved upon. No players in the state could master the men Coach Allardyce had trained. The paper claimed that the Longhorns were undoubtedly the best team in the state and in the Southwest. The Longhorns were the best combination of offensive and defensive football players in the state. Jordan playing at right guard and Goodman at left guard were without rival in Texas. They had no difficulty on offense in getting by the opposing line at any time. And Jordan was believed to probably be the best guard ever produced in Texas, the state, not just the university. In 1913, Coach Weir of Swanee, stated that Jordan would surely have been picked for an All-American position if his work had been in the East. His performance in 1914 was even superior to his play in 1913. The Austin Statesman lamented that, quote, geography ruins his All-American chance. Fortunately, the paper was wrong. He didn't make the first team, but Jordan broke ground when Walter Kemp, the father of American football, selected him as a second-team All-American guard. The Billingsley Report later retroactively recognized the 1914 University of Texas Longhorns as the national champion football team. In December 1914, the Austin American statesman could not restrain its amazement. It did not doubt Jordan's ability, but it was a surprise that Walter Camp had, quote, For the first time in the history of football, a Southerner has been chosen on one of Walter Camp's All-American teams. As far as is known, it is the first time in football history that a Southerner has been selected by anyone for an All-American team. The first man to gain the coveted honor is a Texan. Captain Lewis Jordan of the University of Texas has been selected as a guard on the second team. Jordan, who brought honor to Texas by being placed on the second best team in the country over all Southern football players of all time, went to Texas U, the rawest kind of greenhorn, and in four years developed into the greatest football player ever seen in the South. This is a good spot to take a break, and I'll be back now with some closing thoughts and a preface to the next episode about Jordan. Jordan attended the University of Texas as a scholar athlete from 1911 to 1950. And he was the first and only person from the University of Texas to be named to the All-American football team by Walter Kemp. He was also the first Southerner to be given this honor. Vanderbilt fullback John Manier had been named the first Walter Kemp All-American in 1906 but as a third-team honoree compared to Jordan being honored with a place as a second-team All-American. Georgia Tech center Bum Day became the first Southern member of the Walter Camp All-American first team in 1918. Jordan might have had very little experience playing football when he entered University of Texas. But after being convinced to give it a try, he developed into, as Jonathan Wells wrote, an unstoppable force as an offensive guard, and was also a very strong lineman on defense. He'd been elected team captain in 1914 and led the team to an undefeated season. For many years, he would be remembered as the undisputed best offensive guard in UT history. Jordan also lettered in track for the three years of 1913, 14, and 15, 
and he set a state record in the hammer throw. In the 16-pound hammer throw, Jordan set a record by throwing it 141 feet 2 inches, beating the old record of 135 feet 9 inches. Jordan's accomplishments on the football field made Jordan one of the most famous athletes that ever attended the University of Texas Austin by that point in its history and for some years to come. In addition to his busy academic and sports activities at UT, Jordan was a member of the Old Capital Club and a member of Delta Kappa Epsilon Fraternity. He even worked as an assistant instructor his senior year. He was quite a popular figure on campus, and he was known not only at University of Texas, but across the state. Today, what would happen to a player like Lewis Jordan? He, without a doubt, would have gone on immediately to the NFL and signed a very lucrative contract. But that's not what happened back in those days. Still, everyone that knew Lewis Jordan would have agreed that he had a great future ahead of him when he graduated. And instead of going off to fame and fortune in professional football, Lewis Jordan, he went to work. And then what happened next in Lewis Jordan's story? Well, that's going to be covered in the next episode. Thanks again for listening. The theme music is by the great Derek McClendon. Thanks to everybody that supports the show through Patreon or by clicking that link in the show notes to buy me a cup of coffee. This is appreciated. We'll be back very soon with part two of the Lewis Jordan story. Football star goes to war. I'd like to add that when this episode was being written and recorded, Texas History Lesson Spotlight artist Colton Mathis had recently released his EP, the Frying Pan Acoustic EP. It's got four great songs to add to his catalog, in addition to the songs Fight and Always Mad that were previously released last year. So go do yourself a favor, check it out, give it a few hundred listens. It's it's great music, he's a great artist, and... He's got a lot of talent, and he has a great future himself. So let's end this episode with one of his songs that he's already had out. This one's called Fight. And thanks again for listening. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Be kind. Adios. Been in this life in complacence. You told me that you love me. Well, I ain't got no patience. Cause I really don't believe. But living hard, it ain't easy. And giving up. Don't want to fight. I'm still in this life of complacence. That you always love me. I'm sorry about my displacement. Cause I really don't believe living hard, it ain't easy. And giving up, that ain't right. I don't care if you stay on me. Fight. Yeah, I just don't want to fight.
tears Giving up, it ain't right I don't care if you stay or leave Well, I just don't want to fight Yeah, I just don't want to fight Yeah, I just don't want to fight Yeah, I just don't want to